I'm really not quite sure what to say where to start, but I've always started because one of my heroes in life is a guy called Tom Paine. And Tom Paine involved in the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and Tom Paine said, um, a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it the superficial appearance of being right. And that's what's really, all my life has done that. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it the superficial appearance of being right. It's about making and challenging and questioning the whole time, of not accepting things. And I think that is the story of the big issue, and it's the story of Big Issue Invest, that it challenges everything that we do. So we've got to go back. We've got to go back to 1991. And um, I want you to think of uh, uh, Gordon Roddick, who was Anita Roddick, the great, great Anita Roddick's husband. Is this, a, is this got a big echo on it? Or you know, I'm better without it. I can feel myself echo. I'm going to try it without, and then you can tell me. Shout to me if you can. Can you hear me or not? Yes. All right, that's much better. Um, so, the late, great Anita um, and her husband, Gordon. Gordon Roddick was going in New York, down the street in 1991, and he saw this black guy, and he was surrounded by a lot of white people, and they were talking to each other. Now, in 1991 in New York, that was a rare thing. So, Gordon <coughs> goes up and says, what's going on? And he says, well, look, um, the, the guy says, I'm selling this, mag this, this newspaper. And it was a, it was a kind of a, a newspaper. Um, and he said, I'm a two-time loser in upstate New York. I knew that if I stayed there, I'd go inside and that would be it. So what do I do? I heard about a group of homeless people um, who were going to produce this, uh, write this mag newspaper, sell it on the street, and earn a living. And Gordon thought, Jesus, that's something else. He said, so he came back to England and he thought, I know. And he was like a real early venture capitalist. He said, what happens if we produced a magazine that was value? a magazine that the homeless people were proud to sell, that the public wanted to buy. Um, he said, that's a good idea. I know, I'll go and find my old mate John Bird, who John, he'd met 25 years when John had been on the run uh, and come out of prison in Edinburgh. And John, by that time, had bet himself and he had a small publishing business. And, uh, and he put a bit of money into it. And off we went. And 20 years later, it's our 20th birthday um, this year. 20 years later, um, here we are. It's really interesting because we say to everybody, if I'd come to you and given you an investment proposition and said, look, in 20 years' time, we're going to have a magazine, and it's going to have 146,000 copies, 3,000 vendors, 640,000 readers. McKinsey's will describe it as one of the most trusted brands in the UK, be replicated in 80 different countries. We're going to turn over 15 million, and the 3,000 retailers will earn 8 million pounds. But those retailers will be homeless people, and those retailers will sell it on the street. Oh, and by the way, they're going to have to pay one pound for it because they're going to sell it on the street for two pounds. So we're going to have 3,000 entrepreneurs on the street who are going to have an alternative to begging an alternative to stealing, an alternative to prostitution and street crime. Oh, and by the way, when we make our profit, um, we're going to mug ourselves on the way to the bank and give it to our foundation, and our foundation are going to work to get our retailers off the street so they need to sell your magazine so we can go bust. How bloody daft is that, right? <laughs> and that was it. That was the thing that happened. It was a real, I believe, a transformative thing that transformed from my background, which was like cooperative entrepreneurs, they'd set up a whole load of printing and publishing companies, into what we're now calling social enterprise, where we actually say what we're seeking to do is find business solutions to the social crisis. And then originally in 91, it was a social crisis of homelessness. It was all about self-help. It was all about a simple mechanism of self-help. Um, uh, and that's, that's what's driven us all the way through to what we do, is challenging those norms. We challenge the norms of business, I believe. For example, I remember uh, in 94 or 5, we were going to the bank manager and we said, uh, we want to buy this building we were in. And he said, fine, did you make a profit? He said, no. <coughs> did you make a profit last year? He said, no. But we knew we were cash rich. We really knew that something was completely wrong. So what we did, we went away and we kind of separated out our core magazine business from what we did with our vendors. We didn't have a foundation then that helped our vendors. We financed it all ourselves. And we said, OK, we were spending £43,000 on, on, on hot uh, teas and coffees and whatever for our vendors. 
We spent £135,000 on a resettlement team in London alone for our vendors. When you stripped all that, all that away, when you took it all away, we had a 16% profit on turnover for our core business, which wasn't bad for a publisher. And so we went back to the bank manager and said, can we get our building now? Because if we can't pay for it, we won't do that. And he said, no. And I remember we, we lost the call. We actually lost the call. I don't know what made us think of it. We turned around and said, look, if you went down the road and you saw a publisher with a 16% profit on turnover, I bet you wouldn't turn around to them and say, I'm not going to lend you that money because I don't like the fact that you've got a yacht in my bear. Why yacht in my bear? Do not know. And I said, so what bloody right have you got to come and tell us that we can't spend our profits on homeless people? And we said, if it's what we're doing, we've given up our dividend, we're creating a social dividend. And we coined that term, the social dividend, because we're not frightened of making profit. We can make profit by employing homeless people. And with that profit, we're going to dismantle, try and dismantle what the causes that made those people homeless.